welcome everyone to my talk on Svelte and congratulations to you for being a forward thinking person and wanting to know are there other options out there for building web applications. So you've got all my contact information up here and probably the most important part is right at the bottom here, this GitHub repo where I store all of my talks. So you can go there and find lots of past talks I've given, but in particular, if you go to the Svelte folder there, uh, you'll find the slides that you're looking at here. Uh, so I don't want to spend too much time talking about myself. Basically, I've been doing this a long time. I wrote that book about a year and a half ago on Svelte. Unfortunately for me, quickly after the book came out, uh, Sapper went away and was replaced by SvelteKit. I'll talk about that a bit near the end of my talk today. But basically, SvelteKit has all the features of Sapper and rewritten to do things in a better way. If you are interested in buying the book, I definitely recommend that you go directly to Manning. They always have sales. You should be able to get at least 40% off. If you buy it through Amazon, you're going to pay like double for the book. So Svelte, as you probably are aware, is an alternative to other frameworks like React and Vue and Angular, and it's a compiler. This is very important, and I'm going to talk on the next slide about what the benefits are of being a compiler. You can use JavaScript or TypeScript, like most JavaScript tools these days. It was developed by a guy named Rich Harris, and he created other open source tools that you might have heard of, like Rollup. Reactive is another one. It was a precursor to Svelte. He used to work in the graphics departments at The Guardian and The New York Times. But more recently, he has taken a job at Vercel, where they're paying him full time to develop Svelte. And so that gives us some confidence that it's got some legs and will be well supported going forward. So why is it important that Svelte is a compiler? Well, there's a lot of things that it does that other frameworks can't easily do because they're not a compiler. And one of those is eliminating the use of a virtual DOM. I imagine many of you are familiar with how virtual DOM is used in frameworks like React and Vue. So the idea there is that when you want to make a change to something that's going to be displayed in the browser, it's got to generate a version of what's going to be in the DOM in memory and then compare that to what was there previously and find out what changed and then surgically make those updates. And there are a couple of problems with that. One is, well, how long does it take to generate the virtual DOM? How long does it take to do the diffing? And what about all the code that has to be delivered along with your application to do those two things? And so that's one of the benefits of not having a virtual DOM is not having to do that. Uh, so how does Felt get away from having to do that? Well, one is that it can detect where you you're using state within your components. And because it knows that, it can surgically update the parts of the DOM that need to change when that part of the state is modified. Being a compiler also means it can support custom syntaxes. And we're going to look at a bit of that coming up. Fortunately, there's not a lot of custom syntax for you to learn. It can also detect CSS that you've written in your components that you're no longer using, which is a great thing, because I'm sure you've worked on projects where you're looking at a file of CSS and you have no idea if this is needed anymore. And it's very much trial and error to see, well, if I delete this, will I break anything? But Svelte can tell you right away, oh, that you're not using that bit anymore, so you can delete it. Uh, it can generate optimized JavaScript using only the parts of the Svelte framework that you're actually using. And one example of this that we're going to uh, run into later is that Svelte gives you a lot of support for different animations. And you're probably only using a couple of them. And so when you build your app and ready to deploy, it only includes the code that you're actually using. So you can't just look at Svelte and say, well, it has some good ideas. Let's copy those over to another framework like React, because you really have to be a compiler to do several of these things. So what benefits do you get if you choose to use Svelte? Well, you can write less code to do the same things. You get file-based component definitions, which means I look at a .svelte file, and everything that is related to that component is in the one file. I've got the JavaScript, I've got the HTML, I've got the CSS. It's all in one place. And that CSS is scoped to the component. So if in my component, I'm rendering an H1 element, and I want it to be red, I just say that. And I don't have to worry that I've just made H1 elements and other components red. 
component state management is very easy. So here I'm talking about state that is just used by one component. We're going to see an example of that real quick here. And then often I want to have state that is shared across components. And that's also very easy. For that, we use a thing called stores. It gives us reactive statements. And what this means is that I want something like a spreadsheet. You know how in a spreadsheet you can put a formula into a cell that refers to other cells. And if those cells change, you know this one's going to recompute. That same idea is present in Svelte. You have two-way data bindings. And the most common example of this is that I want to have an input where the user could maybe type in their first name. And then I have a variable called first name. And I want it to be that if the user types something in that input, that variable gets updated. And if my code updates that variable, what's displayed in the input should change. And so Svelte gives you that out of the box. I mentioned a bunch of built-in animations. We'll see some examples of those later. And then small bundle sizes. When the Svelte compiler looks at all the code in your app and compiles it down to JavaScript and CSS, it's a really small amount. There's lots of resources you can find on the web of comparisons between Svelte and other frameworks to show how small these bundle sizes can be. And the reason that's important is it means that there's less to be downloaded to the user's browser, and so the app can start up faster. You're probably familiar with the state of JavaScript survey that comes out every year. And in the most recent one in 2021, I don't want to spend a lot of time going through these numbers. I just want to point out that satisfaction with Svelte is very high. And the usage of Svelte by the people that replied is really growing quickly, up to 20% of the respondents now. So when you're Using Svelte, you're creating components and files with an extension of .svelte, and this is what they look like. There are four sections here, and every one of these sections is optional. The interesting thing about them being optional is if you look at the third section where I have the H1, that could be just some static HTML, and I could delete everything else, and that's a full component, and I can render just some static HTML. But if I want to go beyond that, the first script tag is really rarely used. You see it has context module. And you can think of that like a class scope as opposed to an instance scope. And you would use that if you want to export some functions outside of that file that others could import, or things that you want to share across all instances of this one component. More common is the second script tag. And what we see there with that export statement, that is the way in Svelte that you declare props. And so I'm saying that if some other component wants to render this one, it can pass in a value for name. And then going down to the bit of HTML there, the H1, I'm going to render hello and whatever name was passed in. And then finally, we've got a style tag. Remember, I said this is scope to this component. And so I'm making that H1 red. But that's not going to affect H1s in other components. So the state within a component is just represented by normal variables. There's nothing special you have to do. And so in comparison to React, where you might uh, use a uh, use state hook, here I just declare count as a variable and start it out at 0. And then I go down to my HTML. And in this example, I want three things. I want a button that dec decrements the number, and a button that increments it. And then I want to display the value. And in the click handlers, if I change the variable, well, it sees that I'm using that right in that uh, h1 there. And so it's going to re-render that bit for me. And so this is all the code I have to write for a simple counter. So think about what code you would write in your framework of choice and how much it would be compared to this. There's one gotcha about updating the value of a variable and hoping that it will update your HTML. And that is that if your value is an array, you've got to do something to help Svelte out and let it know that it changed. If you're just uh, replacing a value or pushing something on to the end, it's really still the same array. And so there's kind of some tricks you can use to help Svelte know that you have changed it. A really important tool in Svelte is the REPL. And so if you go to the main Svelte website, there's a REPL link up at the top. And that stands for Read Eval Print Loop. And this is an online tool where you can type in code and test it out. And so you don't need to install or download anything to start playing around with Svelte. So you can put in your code and see the result. You can see the JavaScript and the CSS that the Svelte compiler generates for you. 
you could save what you've done so that you can pull it back later. And so over time, you might develop a, a large set of examples uh, that you want to refer back to later. Then you can take a project that you started in the REPL and export it so you can continue development outside, maybe using a tool like VS Code to continue your development. So I've got lots of examples of REPLs that I've built. And so if you go to my blog website, you'll see that there's a, a link for Svelte. And if you click that, there's a bunch of categories and REPLs is one of those. And you can see some of the REPLs that I often use in demos. And one of those is that counter app that we just talked about. And so if I flip over here, this is what the REPL looks like. And so I've got my code on the left, the result on the right. And so I can click on those buttons and change the value of the counter. Uh, nothing real fancy here, but you can see it's not a lot of code and I can play with it right in the browser without having to download anything. So I mentioned reactive statements. That dollar colon, well, that's just a JavaScript label whose name happens to be dollar sign. And the Svelte compiler kind of co-ops that to say, when I see that, I think you mean that's a reactive statement. And what that means is that any variables that I'm referencing in there, if they change, it's going to run that code again. So the first time through, it runs all of these. And then after that, suppose scores is an array of numbers, and I add a new score or I change a score then Svelte is going to realize that I've done that, and it's going to run that code again and recompute the value of total. And maybe I'm displaying that somewhere, and so my UI will update. In the second example, that's something I can do just for debugging and say that any time the value of total changes, I want to print it out to the DevTools console. And that's all I need to make that happen every time there's a change. The third example, evaluate cart, that's just a function where I'm passing in cart, which is presumably maybe an array of objects describing things I want to buy, and then a tax rate. And so if either of those change, it's going to call the function again. And maybe that has some kind of a side effect, like putting a, a total price in some other variable, and then that will update my UI. And then finally, the most general thing you can do is have a block of code with dollar colon in front of it. And then any variables inside that block of code that change, it's going to re-execute the block of code. So here's a really good example of those reactive statements, a loan calculator. And what I want to do is be able to enter in a loan amount, an interest rate, and a number of years, and have it calculate for me the monthly payment. And so I'm going to pull up the REPL for that, and uh, let's look at that code. So that's right here. And so if I go over to the loan amount and I start bumping up the loan amount, if I go up to uh, a few dollars here, look at the monthly payment there. It's at 23 cents now. And if I keep going up there, it went to 24 cents. And of course, if I bump up the interest rate, it goes up quite a bit. Change the years, it changes. So this is all very reactive. So let's start by scrolling to the bottom here and looking at the HTML parts of this. So I've got a label for the loan amount and then an input. And notice it has bind colon value. That's the way I can bind an input to some variable. And going back up to the top, I had the variable loan amount set at 200,000. And so my UI starts at that value. Similar thing for the interest and the years. They both have a bind colon value. And then at the bottom, I'm going to output the payment with two decimal places, just like you see here. So if I go back up to the top, we had those three variables that I'm binding my inputs to. And then I also have this constant. There's 12 months in a year. Then we have a bunch of reactive statements. So if the number of years changes, well, then I need to recalculate how many total months there are for this loan. And so it's years times the number of months in a year. If you change the interest rate, I need to recalculate what the monthly interest rate is. If you change the loan amount, then I need to recalculate this numerator. There's also a denominator that changes if the months change or the monthly interest rate changes. Uh, and then we get to the most important part, the payment. So if you don't have a loan amount, maybe you've cleared it out or you've entered zero, I can't really compute anything here. And so I'm just going to say the payment is zero. Or if you don't give me a number of years, I can't do it. But if I get past that bit, then as long as I have an interest rate, the payment is just that numerator de divided by the denominator. And if I don't have an interest rate, it's just the loan amount divided by the months. So this is very much like a spreadsheet. You can imagine having a cell in a spreadsheet that contains uh, all of these formulas. 
And this is all the code I need to make this entire thing work. Better yet, think about how much work has to happen when something changes here. Like, what is the work I actually do when the loan amount changes? So I look at the first reactive statement. That doesn't change. It only depends on years. The monthly interest rate doesn't change. The numerator does change. So I have to recalculate that if the loan amount changes. But the denominator doesn't change. But because I use numerator in the calculation of the payment, that has to run again. Uh, then going down to the HTML part, what do I have to re-render? It's not the whole thing. It's only what changed. It's only that last bit, the payment. So if you walk through the steps of how you might implement this in another framework, it's likely that you would repeat all of those calculations because you wouldn't know which ones need to be recalculated and you wouldn't know what needs to be re-rendered and so it might re-render the whole thing. And so this is very efficient and a very small amount of code you write to implement this. Uh, so I mentioned that Svelte supports some special syntax, and this is one example of that. If you want to have some conditional logic inside your HTML to decide what you're going to render, you use this mustache-like syntax. And so Svelte didn't invent this. It just borrowed this from mustache. So I can have an if statement, and then it can have an else part, which has its own if, and then a plain else, and then I end it. And so there's a pattern here that the beginning of these special syntax items, they start with something that has a pound sign in front of it, the pound sign if, and if there's something in the middle, it always has a colon, and then it always closes with something that starts with a slash. So you'll see that pattern again on the next slide. If I have an array of data and I want to iterate over that and render something for each element in the array, I use a pound sign each, and then I give it the array as how I want to refer to each element. And then there are some optional parts after that. If I want the index as I'm iterating through, I can give it a variable that it will set to the index. And then I can have a key expression. That's useful if I'm going to be making modifications to this array, like adding new elements, removing them. Uh, it helps Felt to uh, efficiently update the DOM if you give it that key. There's also an else part which is interesting. So I can uh, very concisely say, I want to render this HTML for each element, but if there isn't anything in the array, render this instead, then I can say something about not having data. So a lot of parts are optional here. Uh, so we've got the if, we've got the each, and those, that's mostly what you use for special syntax inside the HTML. Svelte has a lot of support for animations out of the box. And so you see the names of some of the Svelte packages that give us this and functions that they provide. And we could talk a long time about how all of this works, but I, I just want to show you one example on the next slide. But all of these are CSS-based animations, which means that they're very fast. This is not JavaScript code that's computing what has to happen in the animations. And you can define some custom animations. So if you go to that uh, REPL page that I talked about earlier, you'll see links to all of these examples that are up here. And I wish I had time to show you every one of these, but let's focus on some basic parts of it, the transition animations. And so let me jump back over to the REPL. And here is my transition animations. And it's helpful, I think, to focus on one of these at a time as I click the toggle button. So look at the line that says, this is fade. And I hit toggle, and you see it fades out, and then it fades back in. And then look at this is blur. And this is slide is like a, a window shade going up and down. And you can experiment with the rest of those. But the main thing I want to point out here is what kind of code I have to write to get those. So I have to import them. They're coming from Svelte slash transition. And you see how I'm importing a bunch of those. And then I go down to these lines. And here's the, uh, the this is fade line. So all I had to do is say transition colon fade and give it some options. And the options are all optional, uh, but you see that I have them set to one second duration across the animation and to use an easing function of linear. You've probably heard of easing functions where you're controlling the rate of change uh, within the animation. Very easy to set up. I just have to import it and say, would you please use that? 
So we'll see an example of this in action again when we walk through a demo app coming up. Uh, it's often the case that uh, some component is rendering some other component and that child needs to tell the parent, hey, something interesting happened in me. I want to tell you about it so that you can act on it. And the way you do that is to have the child dispatch an event that goes up to the parent. And this is very easy to do. So in the child component, you have to import the function create event dispatcher comes from Svelte. And then you call that function and it gives you dispatch, which is another function. And now anywhere in your code, you can call dispatch and you give it a name of, a, of an event and you can make up any name you want. And then if you want, you can pass data along with that event that's gonna go back up to the parent. And so here's an example of a parent component. You see how it's importing my child and I have this function handle event. And so when I render my child, which was that component, uh, I specify that I want to listen for this event, my event, whatever I named it up there, and then I give it the function that should be invoked when I get that event. Up there uh, in the function, I get the event. It has a property detail which holds that data that I passed. So it's very easy for a child component to tell the parent, hey, this interesting thing happened and here's some data describing it. And we'll also see that in the uh, sample app coming up. I mentioned that CSS is scoped to the component by default, and this slide goes into detail about exactly how that works, and I don't have time to dig into it, and you don't have to know this, but basically it's just computing a hash from all of that CSS and then marking all of the CSS rules and all the elements that use them with that special hash, and that's how it is achieving the scoping of the CSS. Of course, you might also want to have some global CSS that's not tied to one component. And so the easiest thing you can do is just create a CSS file and then in your topmost uh, component, import that CSS and now any uh, of your components can be affected by that. But there are also cases where I have a component that renders another one and let's say I know that that child component renders an H1 element and it makes it blue. But I don't like that. In my case, I want it to be red. So how could I override what my child component is doing in its CSS? And the answer is that I have some kind of wrapper around where I'm rendering the child so that I can reference that. And then this is the CSS of the parent that is trying to override the child. So I refer to uh, my own class. This is going to be scoped to the parent and I'm saying anything within this scoped class name apply this and so this colon global is kind of a way of saying hey you know that trick you were doing where you were attaching a hash to the names of these things please don't do that to this part let that be just plain uh, class name and then I can give as much of a selector as I want there and now I have changed the color of the h1 that this was rendering to be red instead of blue so that's a, a common technique that you use in Svelte to override child stylings. So now I want to walk through, of course, the typical to-do app, which I think is a good demo of new frameworks to see how all the pieces work. And there's a lot of pieces that I want to review here, all, all that we've mentioned already. So let's pull up the REPL for this and uh, see how this works. So here is the to-do app, and it's telling me I have one of two remaining. Uh, so learn Svelte, build a Svelte app. That one is already finished, so it's crossed out. And of course, I can add new things like buy milk and uh, cut grass. Okay, and I can click a delete button next to one of these. I could check one and notice that my remaining changed from two of three remaining to one of three remaining. So let's see how we would implement this in Svelte. So st to start with, we've got two files here, app.svelte and todo.svelte. And so the todo.svelte is just this bit right here. It's one row that has three things in it, a checkbox, this text, and a delete button. So if I look at the HTML part of this, what you see here is that I've got a list item and notice the transition fade. So when a new to-do item is added, it's gonna fade in, and if I delete it, it's gonna fade out just from that little bit of code. 
And I've got three things. I've got my checkbox, I've got the text of the to-do, and then a button to delete it. And up at the top, I pulled in create event dispatcher. I created my dispatch function, and then I'm calling it in several places. And the reason I'm doing that is that a single to-do, it doesn't really know how to manage itself. It doesn't know how to delete itself or change its done state, but the parent knows that, and so I'm just going to dispatch an event up to the parent. So on my checkbox, I say, it should already be marked as checked if the to-do is already marked as done. And what is passed in here, right here, this component takes one prop, which is a to-do object. Now, if you were using TypeScript, which is a good idea, you could see what kind of object that was and know that its properties are text and done, but this is just plain JavaScript. But you see on the checkbox, I'm referring to the done property. And then if you change the state of the checkbox, I'm going to dispatch this event, toggle done. And I don't have any data going with it. I just want to tell the parent the, to -do st the done state of this to-do has changed. Then I'm displaying the text of the to-do. And uh, it's going to have the CSS class done if the to-do was marked as done. So this is a way of conditionally adding a CSS class to that element. And then finally, I've got my button for deleting the to-do. I dispatch a delete event. There's a bit of CSS at the bottom. R really, the only thing important is that uh, if a to-do is marked as done, I want the text color to be gray and to have a line through it. So now we switch over to the app, uh, the app component, and I'm importing my to-do component. And if I scroll down to the HTML bit, I'm just displaying an H1 that says to-do list. And then I want to display the status. This, that's this part right here, one of three remaining. And you'll see in a bit how we set that string. Then there's a button for archiving the ones that are completed. Uh, you could persist them somewhere. In this case, I'm just deleting them. Uh, then this part right here, this input in the add button, I have that inside a form. And the reason I'm doing that is that I want you to be able to type in the input and just hit the enter key and have that be treated just like you had clicked the add button. And so in my form, I want to tell it uh, when the button is pressed, it thinks that I'm submitting the form, but I don't really want to post data anywhere. And so the prevent default stops that from happening. And I'm just saying, when the form is submitted, call that function add to do. And then I have my input, bind colon value to to do text. So back up to the top, to do text starts off right here as just an empty string. Okay, uh, and then the button here for adding, well, that should be disabled if you haven't typed in any text yet. And so it's disabled if I don't have any text. Then down at the bottom, I'm looping through all of my to-dos. So that's an array that I set up at the top. And for each of those, I want to display a to-do component and I'm passing it the to-do. This is some interesting syntax because in every other framework, you would say to-do equals curly brace to-do close curly brace. But Svelte decided, why should you repeat yourself? If they have the same name, just do that and it means the same thing. Then I'm listening for those custom events that I was dispatching from my to-do component. If I get a delete event, what I want to do is call delete to-do that is defined inside this component and pass it the to-do. I'm iterating through them and putting them in that variable to-do one at a time, and so I'm passing that to-do to the function. And then the same thing for toggling its state. So now if I go back to the top and look at the JavaScript code that I've written, uh, first of all, I need a way to create a new to-do. And so I have this function where I can pass in text and then optionally a to-do if I don't, it, uh, uh, done. If I don't pass that value in, it defaults to false. And all this does is return an object that has an ID, the text, and the done property. Well, the ID, I want to generate that automatically. And so I start at zero with last ID and I just bump it up for each new one that I create. And then I want to begin with some to-dos already in my list. And so I'm creating those right here. To-dos starts off with two uh, to-do objects inside it that are those. 
Back to that uncompleted count where it says one of three remaining, that's an excellent case for using a reactive statement. So I can say status should be this string with uh, substitutions happening here. So if the value of uncompleted count changes, I need to recompute the status. Or if my to-dos array changes, I need to recompute it because the number of to-dos might have changed. And right above that, how many uncompleted do I have? Well, anytime my to-dos array changes, I need to count how many of them are not done and then get the length of that, and that gives me the value. If I want to add a new to-do, well, then I can create it using the text that the user typed in, and then I want to push that on to the end of my array. But Svelte won't know that the array has really changed, and so then I use this tricky bit here. Looks like this line would do nothing at all, but the Svelte compiler sees that as an indication that this has changed and so that it can update the UI. So I usually include this comment after it. So if someone that isn't familiar with Svelte sees my code, they kind of know what's happening there. Then finally, I just typed in something like cut grass and I hit add. I want to clear out that input. All I have to do is set to do text to an empty string and that's going to clear it out because that input had bind colon value to that variable. Okay. And let's just look at one uh, last bit of this. How do I delete a to do? So it was past the entire to do object so I can pull out just its ID and then I can set my to do's array to be what I get if I filter out keeping only the ones that are not the one I'm trying to delete. Okay, and so toggle done is pretty similar to that. So parts of this might uh, look a little strange to you the first time seeing this, but certainly there's not very much code here. And I think there's some good use of reactive statements. You've seen passing props. You've seen one component that imported another one. So there's a lot of pieces of Svelte present in this small example. All right, uh, so we've looked at how state is managed inside one component. It's just regular variables. But what if you want to share data across multiple components? Well, the answer there is to use stores. And there are four kinds of stores you can create. They can be writable, readable, derived, or custom. Writable stores, as you might guess, means that you can change the data in them. Readable means you can't change it. Interestingly, that doesn't mean the data doesn't change, it just means you can't change it. So the way this works is that you could write a readable store that gets its data maybe from a REST service. And it could maybe once a minute call the REST service and pull in new data. And so it's always updating itself. And you can have components that are looking at that store and updating based on the new data. Derived is a way of combining data from multiple stores, maybe doing some calculation with data from them and coming up with new data. And then custom is where you're tightly controlling the, uh, the methods that you can call to make changes or get the data, customizing it. The most uh, simple thing that you can do to use stores is to create a file with a name like stores.js and inside that file you create stores by calling the functions like writable or readable and then you export them and now any component can import those stores and start to use them. These work with a publish subscribe mechanism and so if you refer to the name of a store by putting a dollar sign in front of its name you will automatically subscribe to that store, and then when your component is removed from the DOM, you will automatically unsubscribe. And so here's a very simple example. At the very top, I've got that stores.js file, and I want to define one store, and so I'm importing the writable function, and then I'm calling that to create the store, and the value that I pass could be anything. It could be a Boolean, a number, a string, any kind of object, an array, whatever I want. And in this case, it's an object that has two properties, first name and last name. And I put that in the variable user. So I've got a store called user, and it's exported. And so what I want to create is this UI here where I have two components. So one component is going to render an input where you can type in a first name and a last name, and then it's going to render this component. And then this part right here is the bottom 
where I'm just displaying a greeting to that person and then I have a button that can clear out their name. Okay, so starting from this uh, first component, which is like the parent, uh, I'm importing the store and then I'm importing the other component, which is this one. And then I have two inputs. They have placeholders displayed when there's nothing in the input yet. And then they both use bind colon value. And notice how I have a dollar sign in front of user. And so what this means is that I'm going to display what is currently in those properties, first name and last name. But if the user types in there, it's going to change those properties in the store. Well, when those change, this component is also using that store and I've subscribed to it by using the dollar sign. And so right here, I'm going to get the current value of first name and the current value of last name. And then if I click the uh, button here, I'm going to call clear, which is this function. And I totally replace what is in my store with this object and I've cleared it out. This to me is incredibly simple when I think back to the other frameworks I've used in the past and how I worked with them. For example, compare this to what you would write if you were using Redux with React. It's just so simple. Say you want to have a store, tell it what data goes in it, just put a dollar sign in front of the name and now all your components can get the data and they can all update it if you chose to make it writable. Uh, this slide summarizes what your options are for communicating between components and the ones that are bold are the ones that you use most frequently. And so th this is good to come back to if you're confused about how you can do these sorts of things. So if I've got a parent component that wants to send data to a child, that's just passing props to it. Sometimes you want to pass more than just data. You want to pass a chunk of HTML that the child can render in a certain way. Uh, and so you use slots for that. We talked about events, so I can go in the other direction, passing data from a child up to the parent. <coughs> context is almost never used. I think I'll skip talking about that one. Uh, module context I mentioned is a way that you can have data that is shared between all instances of the same component. Maybe you want to count how many instances you've created, and so that's a place where you could store that count. And then finally, stores that we just talked about are a great, w great way to share data across components regardless of where they are in the hierarchy of your component tree. I mentioned SvelteKit earlier that replaced the Sapper framework. This is kind of like Next for React or Nuxt for Vue, and it gives a lot of features. One of them is file-based page routing. And what we want here is to be able to have a directory inside where we're developing our code where I can place files and know that the name of those become the route that I'm going to navigate to to go to that page. And these can be nested as deep as I want to have uh, routes with a, a path like slash foo, slash bar, slash baz. I, I can create that just by a directory structure. And I can do a similar thing for defining APIs. So if I want to have a node-based set of REST services, I just put my code in a certain directory with a certain structure, and that gives me the paths to those API endpoints. Uh, SeltKit gives me layouts so that I can say, well, this set of pages, they've got a common header, a common footer, a common left nav, those sorts of things, so I don't have to repeat that across those components. I can have an error page, so if something goes wrong in my app, this is the way I display an error to a user. Code splitting is a really interesting feature. If you're just using Svelte, I mentioned how it produces really small bundle sizes. But this is even better. What this does is it says every page of your app is its own bundle. And it bundles up just the JavaScript and CSS needed for that. And so when you visit the first page, it only loads a little bit of your code. And then you visit the next one, it loads what's needed for that page. And then building on top of that, prefetching is a way for you to say, some of my pages, before I can render them, I need to call some REST services and load data that they're going to render. And so if the user hovers over a link that would take them to that page, there's a good chance they're going to click it. And so why don't I get started now calling the REST services and getting the data so that when they actually click it, it'll come up super fast. All you have to do is add an attribute to that link to say you want prefetching and it just happens. 
Uh, you can have static pages or complete static sites with SvelteKit so that you're uh, not generating the code in the browser at runtime. Hot module reloading makes your development really fast. You can iteratively make changes and see the updates in the browser really quickly. And there's support for setting up common tooling like TypeScript, ESLint, and Prettier. Finally, there are adapters for deploying to different targets. So if you want to target something like Vercel, you just tell SvelteKit that's your target, and it generates all the code you need to make that easy. So if you want to get started using SvelteKit, this is the command you enter to create a new project. It's going to ask you a bunch of questions that you see over here. It's asking you, do you want to start with some pre-built code, or do you want to start with a skeleton project, just the very bare bones? And do you want to use TypeScript, ESLint, Prettier, and then Playwright? That was a new one to me. I've been a fan of Cypress for a long time for end-to-end -end testing. Playwright uh, has some advantages over Cypress, and that's what SvelteKit wants to give you by default. So once you have generated your project, you CD into the directory it created for you. You run an npm install to install all the dependencies, and then uh, npm run dev to get it started. Starts on port 3000 by default, and that's what it's going to render for you. And then you go to town modifying the code it's given you and create new components. So I just want to show you one more thing before we close here. I mentioned the page routing that SvelteKit gives you. And so here's an example of how this works. So here is my main page, and I want to have some links across the top where if I click those, I'm going to go to a different page in my app. And so on the left, <coughs> you see in my routes directory, I have index.svelte. So that's the main page. And then I have added two other files, page 1.svelte and page 2.svelte. And then I've got some global CSS up at the top. And what's really great about this is that my links are just like that, ahref slash page 1 and slash page 2. It's normal HTML. It's not some special kind of thing I need to create these links. And the rest is just some styling of this. But now if I click one of these, it's going to display what you see in those H1 tags. So it's very easy to set up a set of pages and the routing between them just with normal anchor tags. So uh, developers like Svelte for a lot of reasons. A big one is that you can write less code, and another is that that code you do write is really easy to understand. And so we get really good developer experience and not sacrificing user experience uh, while getting that. So I encourage you to give Svelte a try and see if it simplifies web development for you. And so we've got some time here for some questions. Uh, anyone want to lead off? Yes. So I've thought about this. The, the question is, uh, uh, this looks amazing. Are there any disadvantages to using Svelte? And I've yet to come up with an example where I felt like, well, I shouldn't do this in Svelte. I should use some other framework. Now, I will say, uh, if you want to develop a, a native mobile app, it's not going to do that for you. And so in that case, I really would suggest that you take a look at things like Flutter or Swift UI. Uh, but if you really want a web app, I'm not aware of anything that you can't do with Svelte and SvelteKit that you could do with some other framework. Yes? Uh, so can I pass functions like as a prop? Yes. Uh, so uh, the question is, uh, what can I pass from one component to another? And so using props, I can pass any kind of data. It could be a primitive type, an object, an array. It can be a function. Yes? Right. Uh, so the question is, uh, how does Svelte compare to other newer frameworks like Solid? So I have taken a look at Solid, and I can tell you that despite my bias from having spent all the time writing a book on this and giving lots of talks, I'm ready to ditch this any day now. As soon as someone comes out with something better, I'm fine with that. And so I've taken a look at Solid, and to me, I still have to write more code with Solid than I do here. Uh, so. If there's ever a framework that lets me write even less than this, I'd be open to it. But I don't feel like Solid is there yet. 
I think Solid is better than some other frameworks that I won't name, uh, but I don't think it's quite as good as Felt right now. It is, yes. Yes. So the question is, uh, does SvelteKit support dynamic routing? And uh, if what you mean is, could I generate the path that I want to go to at runtime, then yes, I definitely can do that. Uh, the pages it knows about, uh, that, that is known at compile time based on the directory structure. So I don't believe I can introduce new pages at runtime, but I can dynamically choose which ones I'm going to at runtime. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, what is happening behind the scenes that allows Svelte to, to detect changes and know what has to be updated? And the answer is exactly what you said. So if I go back to the REPL here, and then we take a look at the counter example, and then I click on this JS output, you can start scrolling through this, and you're going to see in here that there's this sort of code right here. It's checking to see uh, what did you change. And so that's what the Svelte compiler is doing, is generating code that has conditional logic in it, and it's checking whether something changed and deciding what needs to be updated. And lucky for us, we don't have to write this kind of code. The compiler is doing this work for us. Yes, so you could have a variable A that depends on B, B depends on C, and C depends on A, and the Svelte compiler will give you a message and say that you've got a cyclic dependency, so it will catch that for you. Yes? Yes, uh, so the question is, are there any known issues with using third-party JavaScript libraries? That's actually one of the, the benefits of using Svelte is that People have reported that they feel less of a need to pull in or find a, a Svelte-specific library, that the vanilla JavaScript libraries work very well with Svelte. Part of the reason why that's the case is that Svelte, in the end, is very vanilla. It's just generating some JavaScript code. It's using the DOM in a very direct way. And so if you want to use a library that also does that, it tends to just work with Svelte. Yes? Right, so the question is, when you're running your code and there's a bug, what are you looking at in the debugger? Are you looking at the generated JavaScript code or are you looking at the Svelte code that you wrote? And the answer, uh, like in a lot of frameworks, is that there's source map support. And so by default, you're looking at the code that you wrote. And I'd have to say that in my uh, year and a half, coming up on two years of working with Svelte, I have never debugged anything by looking at the generated code. I've always only needed to look at the code I wrote, and fortunately, that's what it shows me when I'm looking in the browser dev tools. Any other questions? Yes. Right, so uh, uh, I'm not stepping across the generated conditional logic, uh, and I, I haven't seen a case where I needed to do that. Whenever there's been a bug, it's always been in my code, but I, I understand what you're asking. There's this code that I can't go through line by line. Instead, all I see is that I had code that changed this variable, and now all these DOM updates happened. I, I'm not walking through that code. Yes, so, so if there were bugs in Svelte itself and I needed to debug that somehow, you're raising a very valid point. It's just that I've never encountered that situation or heard of anyone else hitting that. And so I, th I think the bottom line is that the code that Svelte generates to do all that DOM checking, 
I guess it's very mature at this point. No one's found any more bugs in it. Any other questions? Yes. Other than what? Oh, yeah. So the question is, what if you don't like the mustache syntax that Svelte uses? Can you use something else instead? Uh, so there is a way that you could say, for example, in the style tag that you want to use SAS. And I think that there's also a way that you can say you want to use pug syntax for your HTML. Uh, I know that there are uh, ways that you can have a Svelte component that is outputting Markdown and it will convert that to HTML for you. Uh, so I think that's the answer if you had switched to something like Pug, but uh, Pug doesn't have its own conditional logic, does it? I'm, I'm not aware of that. Yeah, so I, I haven't seen anybody do that. It's an interesting question because people from React uh, might say, well, we really like it that all the logic inside our HTML is pure JavaScript. We don't want to use any other special syntax. Uh, but there's some downsides to that as well. And so one of those, if you're a React developer, you might be familiar with the idea that whenever you want to render something, you have to render one element. And what if you want to render three? Well, the answer is you wrap it in a fragment, right? And that gets around that limitation. But you don't have to do that in Svelte because that uh, pound sign if statement, what you put inside it can be any number of elements. It doesn't have to have a, a root that it's rendering. So that's one advantage of that. Uh, and some people like the idea that it's maybe more visible that this is a conditional logic when they see pound sign if versus seeing something like Boolean expression uh, uh, and sign to and sign and then some JSX. They, some people find that easier to read that it begins with the word if. But certainly opinions vary on that and it's something to get used to if you haven't used that syntax. Yes, like PHP. Yes. Yes, so, uh, yeah. So, so the comment is that uh, the creator of Next.js also works at Vercel, where Rich Harris works, who created Svelte. Uh, will there be some conflict there? I believe that Vercel and Netlify, those companies have decided that uh, supporting multiple frameworks is good for their business because they want to sell you uh, deploying to their platform and they don't want to lock anybody out. And so the more frameworks they can support, the more business they pull in. And so it seems like they're content with supporting multiple frameworks. Any other questions? Yes. No, it would still keep going. Uh, so the question is, I talked about prefex, prefetching, uh, where you can hover over a link and that will start the uh, API calls for that page to start running in the background. Well, what if you hover over three links? It will launch the API calls for all of them and it's not gonna stop the previous ones. So on the one hand, it's hard to stop them. But on the other hand, if they hovered over it at all, maybe they're gonna come back to it later. And so maybe you won't mind that it finished that work ahead of time. But certainly if there's a page that what it's doing is really heavy, you don't have to opt into the prefetching. You could just do the prefetching on certain links if that became a problem. Yes. Some options. Yeah, so here I'm back in my REPL and I'm clicking on this icon of the floppy disk and it's going to, what, oh, save. Now here, I need to click your saved apps. And then I'm gonna look for uh, spin. Yeah, so this is a custom transition I created and it's loading it up for me now. 
And so you see the code that I've written over on the left, this spin transition, this is mostly comments. And so it's passing in this uh, T value. That's the time going from zero to one across whatever duration I've selected. And so uh, my job is just to return the bit of CSS that's gonna render at that point in time. Uh, let me do a refresh here. Uh, there we go. So I click on this toggle button and you see that spins and gets smaller like it's going down a drain and then it's coming back. Uh, so this is an example of a custom transition and there's not much here. I'm just saying, well, if you wanna show it, then render this, otherwise don't render it. And uh, right, let's see, where is my transition? Oh, it's right here. I want to use the spin transition and that's defined right here. It's just a JavaScript function, just doing a bit of CSS. Oh, yes, so, so the special things like bind colon, transition colon, can I implement my own? I don't believe you can. There's a set of them that Svelte provides that lets you do special things, but I'm not aware of a way to invent your own. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much for attending today. Have a great lunch, and if you want to talk Svelte, find me at lunch. I'd be happy to do it.